Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Stewart here. I'm with Liz Trotter. We've got a couple of awesome guests today. Dan Smith is back, and he's going to be helping us with more technology hacks. And Matt Ricketts is with us as well. Hello, folks. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey, good afternoon. Yay. Fine. It is Wednesday, the 12th of May. Can you believe May is almost halfway over? Okay. Have you all noticed that for every date, Tom has something to say that like illustrates the date in a new way that makes you go, dang it. <laughs> every, every day on the seventh, it's like, wow, we're already a weekend. Are we a weekend on the eighth? Wow, we're working on halfway through the month already. I'm like, how's he doing that? <laughs> and, and and you know, you know, Denise sent me a footlocker full of hats for like all the different holidays that, that you can imagine. I gotta scrounge through there to see if I can find the one for Memorial Day because that's gonna be here in a couple of weeks, isn't it? It's coming up. Yeah, I, I have a good one for Memorial Day that she sent me. Thank you for that, Denise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I don't know if she's on yet. I don't see her yet. I don't think she's here. It's okay. When you go back and watch this later, Denise, you'll see about it. <laughs> you know, stock market today, you know, gee whiz, depends on which market you're looking at, dropped a couple of points, two or three percentage points, which is a whole lot of money. And everybody's concerned about inflation. At least investors are. The government's kind of denying it's happening, but uh, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to, to shift the consensus or not. And, you know, corn, for instance, wasn't a couple of months ago, it was like $3 a bushel. Now it's over $7 a bushel and it's going up. And any type of meat typically is fed corn. And, you know, a piece of plywood costs 100 bucks now. But it's not really slowing down consumption. People are they're still building homes like crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So, crazy right now. From a smart business move standpoint, what does that mean to us as house cleaning business owners? It means that we're going to be paying more for everything too, including our labor, right? We've talked about this before, but just a reminder, if you haven't been raising your rates, now's a good time to be thinking about it. And if you are bemoaning that that everybody is that the government is paying them too much and unemployment is causing this problem, stop. Just stop complaining about that because it's not getting you anywhere. You're not. It's not making you feel better, and it's not helping you to take action. So yeah. it doesn't matter why. Solid. Yes. We just gotta we gotta jump on this bandwagon. Actually, we want to jump in front of the bandwagon, right, Tom? Yeah. You be chasing it. I've chased it. I've gotten in front of it. And as long as you're guessing right, every once in a while you get in front of something, it doesn't come. And that's not very much fun. But if you guess right and you get in front of it, you're 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 in an awesome position. And I think that we're right on this. I think uh, we're on our way to higher wages. And you can wait a couple of months and find out that you're the last uh, last company on the block that's uh, raising their wages. And at that point, everybody's already got a job. Or, or, you know, now's a, now's a really good time to, to, to get in front of it, I think. I agree. <clears throat> I agree. I agree. Now, for those that were not on the call on Monday, Tom, you um, you made a, a comment that you've kind of jumped in already. Is that is that right? Yeah. You've taken some steps in that direction? Yeah, that's right, Dan. We um, announced Monday that our new uh, minimum wage across our branches <laughs> Georgia and South Carolina, and the and the the official minimum wage in in those states is still the federal minimum wage at seven twenty five, but uh, ours is fifteen. So that means anybody that we hire from this point forward is going to be started at fifteen, and it means all of our incumbents got a pretty decent increase. You know, making sure that everybody's about fifteen, and if they were already you know, a few months higher than what our previous minimum wage was, then they got, you know, a pretty decent increase above them. Keep them a decent amount above 15. So I'll keep you posted on how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping ahead of it as you, as you said, it's good. We've, uh, we did this a while back and we, um, I, I did a presentation today and I was looking at my, um, my turnover 
for um, you know week by week for the year, and you could kind of watch the trends of like our turnover was pretty good, pretty good. Then there's that stimulus hit around like the tenth or twelfth week of the year, all the way to the fourteenth of the week. My uh, turnover annually went, my annualized turnover went up to about 350%. And then it's been declining since then and back down to about 170%, um, you know, just looking at the data. But the uh, the interesting thing is I've gone four weeks in a row without losing anyone. We've ha- we've, we've gained five employees. So I, I think that the trend is going right. Although I think we have another two that started this week on top of those five that maybe you know, maybe aren't, um, we'll see, well, you know, maybe they're watching, but I don't think so, but I, I think uh, they might not make it, but we've overall done really good with the hiring over the last uh, the last couple of months. And I'm hopeful that everyone makes it when they start because it's such an investment to bring them on. So we're, we're seeing positive trends. And that- I, I do want to caution everyone too, that the, the new, minimum wage, the the higher wage that people are expecting from us, that is now becoming um, um, a a barrier of entry, y'all, to be able to get people in. This is not going to be the thing that is going to make people stay at your company. If you get it in your head, well, I'm paying them so much money, they better be happy. That's that's not what this is. That's not going to happen. And you need to never think that thought. If it entered into your mind at all, ever, hash it out now. It's not happening. As I say, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one other thing I want to throw out there, then we can hop back up, up on this, this train of thought. But is anybody running into situations where they're running out of gasoline? Like if you're in the Southeast or the East Coast, because... It's becoming a real thing here in South Carolina. Wow. The so, Colonel yeah. Pipeline got, you know, hacked and, um, you know, I guess there was a ransomware attack. And I guess that happened Saturday. And I drove, I spent the day in Myrtle Beach today, which is about two hours north of here. So I drove by a bunch of gas stations. Half of them had the little yellow bags over the gas you know, pump handles indicating that they were, were out of gas. Wow. And yeah. the other half had like serious gas lines. And, you know, I was, you know, I remember the kids seeing what was happening in the early 70s where you had to have an even and an odd license plate to determine what days you could get gas and people just lined up forever. That was happening here. I saw that today in South Carolina. Not with even an odd thing, but. I mean, people like backed out into the road, you know, cars like a dozen deep waiting to get to a gas tank. Oh, all right. Good to know. Good to know. Wow, that's I mean, crazy. I haven't heard anything like that. We, we, we had some people in Georgia that in Atlanta that couldn't go to work today because they couldn't get gas. So this is one of the times when I think my husband is so amazing. We have two of those really big drums full of gas that he treats and he uses them every so often and then gets more and treats it. So we always, have, so now y'all know where to come from. Is for the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> he, you know what? He is kind of a little bit of a prepper. We definitely have like the, the five gallon buckets of food and we definitely have like the, the water tablets and I don't know what all we have. We have a whole big thing. So <laughs> a little bit. Like CNN's on top of it. That's a shortage. And important and from what I understand, there really isn't a shortage, but people are hoarding it. It's kind of like the whole toilet paper thing, you know. Plenty of it, but people are hoarding it. But we're hoarding no differently than we have always hoarded. <laughs> so we're not impacting anything. Same hoard ratio, huh? Yeah. That's the way. There, there, there's one more thing I, I, I want to share, which is, is kind of important. I, I, I shared I went to Myrtle Beach today. Oh, uh, Raymond. Yeah, a number of us know uh, Christine and Raymond Mace. And Raymond passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, I guess he took ill a little over a year ago, which is just kind of an interesting story. They, they, Christine and Raymond travel a lot. They were in England and they're originally from England, but they were visiting and 
he fell ill, had a, had a health problem, a heart problem, and he was in the hospital and he wanted to be treated in the U.S. and they really didn't want to discharge him. So basically escaped from the hospital. And like when he was on the airplane, you know, the authorities came in and said that, you know, you, you know, the hospital reported you missing. And he goes, yeah, I know that. I'm going back to the States to get my surgery and they let him go. And that was a little over a year ago, but his health declined and, um, don't know what to say about Raymond. He was, if, or for you guys who know him, he was uh, very charismatic, very flamboyant, always dressed as sharp as anything could. Lit up a room. When Raymond was around, everybody knew it. Um, he grew up in an orphanage, joined the Royal Navy at the age of 16, um, rose through the ranks of, 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 a, of a significant company with, with within England that did vending machines and spent a lot of time in the States working in various parts of the country in that industry and um, just really heck of a guy and, and, and he's going to be missed. Yeah, absolutely. He will. Their company is Royal Maids in, uh, in Myrtle Beach. And if you're ever around, uh, give, uh, give Christine a yell. They've got a really cool business. The whole thing's built around their English background. Uh, you know, Christine kind of kind of tags herself as Lady Christine, and she does some radio ads and TV stuff. And um, she's quite uh, quite a personality as well. Yeah, he will be he will be missed by a lot of people. Hmm. A lot of people. Did you go to the service today, Tom? I did. I went up there. They had a service today at 11 Eastern. It was really good. They've got uh, some kind of off way, off off Broadway type stuff that they do there, like live entertainment. Kind of, you know, I guess really kind of like some of the stuff that you might see in a in a, in a Nashville or, or or a Branson type thing. And they had some of the talent that that does that, like professional talent, like sing and you know play music and stuff and. You know, I've been to, to, to I've been to a few funerals in my life, but I've never been entertained like this. And it was quite a production. It would have been it would have been what Raymond would have wanted. Yeah, that's very cool. I've never been to anything like that either. That's that's awesome. I love that. Wow, he, uh, he did it right. So um, we want to talk about technology, kind of picking up on the theme that, that, that we're on Monday for, for you guys that were here Monday. Uh, you know, Dan and, and, and Gosha were with us. They were talking about the technology and I guess it's the workflow and the process that they're using to get reviews. And, you know, we can, we can, we can pick up on that for a minute and then we, I guess we want to move into some, some, some other areas where, where you know, technology is going to be important because getting reviews is good for, for, for getting customers. I think it's kind of a, a lead part of the whole marketing process. Um, did we talk, we didn't really talk about tools per se on on uh, the lead, you know, on, on getting reviews, did we? No, no, we really didn't dig into tools. Um because there's a number of ways to do it. And I know uh, uh, with the, the different software pieces that, that business owners have in place today, um, some have automation tools built in, Made Central being one of them and um, Service Autopilot being another. Uh, so there's the capacity for, for people to achieve um, such an automation with the tools they have. Uh, or if they don't have that in place, um, they can you know homebrew, put together something with uh, the tool front, such as Zapier, right? It's a, an automation um, component that shakes hands, if you will, between different software pieces. Um, that's a, a more manual way to get it done, but that's a, an example. Um, so I didn't drill into the uh, tools because there's really more than one way to skin a skin a good, genuine review, if you will. Do we want to maybe just take a, a, a high level? View because if people saw that and want to know, hey, that's cool. I'd like to be able to do that with with tools. Matt, I know you've got some familiarity with some of the tools on the marketplace that for yeah. review generation. Yeah, and I would one tool I'd like to just test real quick is if uh, Liz or Tom, if you guys one of you guys could kill, dial down your speaker a little bit because I'm getting so much feedback. 
Um, I don't know if I'm the only one hearing it because I've tried yeah, to go, go now. Yeah, let me see. Um, so what I what I was gonna say, there's a few tools. You know, Dan was talking about you know kind of homebrew or um, you know do it yourself, and that's sort of what I did for years using something like Formstack, tracking their you know tracking the request, and basically um, you know the problem I found with that was is we didn't have a good system to mark that we had already asked them within the last six months, and so that became cum cumbersome. So um, there's services like like bird's eye, um, that's probably like the gold standard of review requesting and, um, you know, probably the most expensive, probably $300 a month would, would be a, a, a tool like bird's eye. So very granular data, like really, really robust tracking and, um, uh, you know, compliant with, compliant with Google for um, things like the way that you ask, like, you're really not supposed to gatekeep your reviews. Like if you're gonna ask, you should really ask every customer that you serve. That's probably best practice. That's what I do is I just, um, even though our, our you know, we kind of survey them first and then kind of gatekeep them at that point and ask for a review. I go ahead the next day just to avoid um, Google saying that we're gatekeeping. I send out a request to everyone that we served the day before through nice job. I don't use bird's eye, I'm evaluating bird's eye, um, but, uh, you know, nice job um, is what I'm currently using. Is simple. It's basically nice job is like a simple version of Bird's Eye, like like a stripped down, basic tool. And I think it's seventy five dollars a month. Does a lot of the same things. Not as granular. Not as rich data. Um, but probably for our purposes, more than enough for for what we're doing. So those would be the two that I I like best. It's like one is top of market. One is kind of one is kind of what would be considered lower tier software, very simple. But um, you know, for seventy five bucks, I'm using Nice Job just to make sure that I'm Google compliant. I like that one. Dan, are you, are you familiar with any? I'm, and there's there's probably a half dozen, but yeah, I I am. I um, on Monday I spoke to that specifically and wanted to make sure that in talking about the review automation that I was. Um, kind of sharing with the community, uh, I wanted to make sure exactly what you just drove home on. There's pre-built solutions out there. So tell us, nice job, bird's eye are all um, probably the dominating three, if you will. Um, and going back to Monday, for those of you that follow every day, one of the things that I touched on is there's no wrong answer, right? If bird's eye is working well for you and, and, and just cranking out those reviews, um, that's, that's wonderful, but, but not everybody can afford, um, a, a 200, $300 solution present day. Um, Matt, one of the things that I touched on was the, um, I, and I know many business owners that use those services and they work exceedingly well. Um, we have found success with um, the intimacy of the message coming from a person in our office, um, all through automations, uh, but it coming from the entity in which they have the relationship with, yeah. as opposed to a third party um, brand label uh, machine that albeit does 20 other things that are amazing and plug into social media and, and SEO and um, some really great things, uh, no doubt. But uh, at a core level, if you are wanting to make sure that you're um, getting reviews today, gosh, there's a, there's a way to make sure that you're staying on top of it. Because what we, what we all know is just asking once, um, the return on that is, is so low. And the act of following up to ensure a higher return is almost impossible, right? Because we've got the next call, the next client. Um, yeah. So be it uh, a, a pre-made solution, be it something you put together with automations. Um, what's most important is that social proof, making sure that you're doing what you can to stand out in your local market with credible, genuine uh, reviews that uh, that play on the right side of the Google ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. You, I'm sure you probably hit on it um, when you guys were talking Monday too, but I mean, most of the signals that Google is looking for as far as, uh, I mean, as far as uh, how they're, how they're going to deliver your Google guaranteed, if you're going to do an ad or your Google, your, your, your Google local page, you know, to, to searchers is going to be on review velocity. How much frequency of reviews are you getting? You know, I, I mean, even if they're mediocre, it's better than getting none. Right. So as far sure. as, as far as Google's concerned, as sure. far as delivering you, you know, then, then I think third, the third on the list after how close you are to where they're searching by, you know, so that's like kind of a more of a relevance factor as far as um, 
distance from the uh, from the search. The third factor is actually your your review rating. The fourth one, I think, is activity on your page, but I can't remember. They they changed that one. The form the fourth one, and you have some control over that as far as like you know making updates, making sure that you're posting things on your on your Google Places, Google local Google local page. So yeah, I think you, you can do a lot of that yourself, and um, you can have a lot of great results because most people in our space might have ten or twelve reviews. If you get fifty. Uh -huh. You get a hundred. My company has two fifty. You probably you probably have more than I do. Then you know. So it's like, um, it's you know, I saw someone the other day had like four hundred. I mean, and they're not any bigger company than me. They're just better about asking. Uh, yeah, that's that's the key. Putting a tool in place, uh, whatever it might look like to to ask. Um, the uh, the credibility factor. You hit the nail on the head, Matt. When someone is comparing you against other people. Um, there, there is that business out there and, and some of the people watching today might fall into this category. Like they're happy that they have 40. They're excited that they have 60 reviews and, and that's good. Keep charging, keep adding. Um, but when your competitor has 200 or 300 for most people shopping, it's, it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. Matt, to hear that you're at 250, um, I'm at 248. So I just sent a message to my office manager. We need three more before yeah. this call ends. Before this call ends, we want to. I might accidentally wanna... be at 245. I think you might actually be ahead of me already. I think we want to keep it. I may have been rounding up, to be honest. So, <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting in terms of ranking in the map pack. Sometimes companies with fewer reviews and maybe even a lower average score ranks higher than companies with more reviews and higher scores. Sure. More, more recent activity, more, you know, it's just maybe, maybe even though they're, they're it's half a dozen different things that yeah. like I think Moz has a, has an article. It's like eight different things and you're right. Making sure your pictures are there, making sure you're updating it regularly, having, and they evolve that too. I guess the configuration on, on, on that they they keep adding more opportunities to, Put more stuff there, right? Yeah, they they, they do. Okay. And and Matt touched on making sure that you're playing in all the different realms that are relevant. And I, I do think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, not knowing exactly what they're basing things on. If you're doing your updates, if you're um, you know adding images, if if you're just playing in the ecosystem, um, you're strengthening your position across the board. It may not be overnight. Um, but as things change, they release something new, just making sure you're playing in their world as they want to play. Um, you will be rewarded over, over time. There's, there's no doubt on the, on the Google platform. Yeah. I think that that's, this is, you know, we could probably end up talking about this all day. Um, I think, um, what I, you know, as far as technology goes, maybe we want to pivot to maybe some scheduling and dispatch tools. That, oh, Liz has a question. Yeah. Let, let me just say one thing real quick for anybody that wasn't on the call on Monday, one of the things that Dan hit on that that I think is really, really important that the other uh, sites don't do, Sotellus, nice job, um, um, even BirdEye, um, is he reaches out to them every single time they have a good interaction of any type. So if the customer calls and gives a new credit card number, great, we're so ha happy to help you with that, Mrs. Johnson. Would you know, and he uses his little spiel. But whenever, any time they have any good uh, engagement with the customer, which I think makes a really, really big difference. It's not just around the cleaning, it's around all of it, the whole experience. I agree, that's, that's brilliant. And I think the way that you ask and kind of preface it, like, Hey, would you mind, you know, give us an review? And then like the follow-up email or follow-up text, I mean, is is probably the, the critical factor. I think, I mean, not to talk about Made Central, but I think Tom and I should really talk about building that sooner or later and kind of yeah. automating yeah. that at some point. Cause I think yeah. the way the way you think is the way that we need to be, you know, moving um, and making it really easy for people to do that. So yeah. That's, that's if, brilliant. If you're interacting with the customer and if you're doing anything other than being yelled at and threatened to be fired, you should be asking for a review. I, yeah, I did a talk today and I, you know, basically I, 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 one of the things I really hit on is, is that uh, operations is marketing. I mean, you're the way that you, 
the way you operate your business and the way that you deliver your service is your biggest piece of marketing that you that you do, whether you know it or not. And like every one of those touch points you have needs to be positive. So, you know, having the right people on the bus, the right human interfaces and the right technology that's facing your customers that makes it easier for them to deal with you is is really critical. You know, one one communication tool that we, we just talked a lot about is is text messaging. It sounds like it's like simple, but there's a lot to it. I think there's a lot of technology that you can really put into place with text messaging. Um, I think as far as a customer service touch point, I think we should talk a little bit about that, about about how that actually is improving customer service and um, you know delivery. So um, that might be something a little bit tech wise to talk about in, in terms of you know any, all the way from you know communication and sales all the way through you know it, it even helps with scheduling and dispatch of, of your day and how you're communicating with your customers. So it might be. Uh, I have in a mastermind group, Matt, with an attorney. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much about sales from him okay. because his point is that that's all he does. He has, he's a trial attorney and that's all he does is he has to sell this, his, his solution, his, his argument to the jury and to the judge and how he goes about that is so much different than what we would normally think. It's not just about telling the story, which is what we all think it is, but it's so much more than that. And Dan speaks without maybe recognizing that he's speaking to it, but he speaks to a lot of this stuff. Um, one of the things is meet them where they are. You Before you give them what you wanna give them, you have to give them what they want. So, that, that's a, a big thing that, that my friend is always talking about. He's like, if the, it doesn't really matter what you tell the jury if they're not ready to hear it. They have to be ready to hear it. So you have to get them in the place where they're ready to hear your message. And a lot of that has to do with little stuff that you would not think about. Like what kind of language do, does everybody use in the courtroom? So what kind of language is the customer using? And if you're texting, same thing. Are they texting to you with no capitalization and no periods? Should you respond to them in the same way or should you respond to them in a more uh, professional way? His, his response to that is professional to start and as quickly as you can bring it down, bring it down to their level. So they feel like they're back and forth with you. Now they're in relationship. So I just thought it was really interesting how, um, Everything that we do here ties back to sales and all the other parts of our lives as well. And at the end of the day, we're selling all day long, and selling is a lot more than getting somebody's credit card. We're selling the idea that we have an awesome service. We're selling the idea that we have awesome jobs. We're selling the idea that it's important to set your alarm clock and get out of bed every day and come to work. We're I mean, you can go on forever, but we're, we're, we're <laughs> selling. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt when, when it comes to the technology front, it's not just a matter of um, how can I use technology to get more sales, right? It's how, how technology impacts the efficiency of your office, how it impacts the um, uh, interaction with your team, whether, you know, it's throughout the week or, or in the moment uh, your clients kind of across the board. And I know all too often um for some people, uh, especially maybe new to, to business, that can be daunting. Uh, you're trying to build a, a cleaning empire and um, every, you know, every other Facebook post is try this software or try this service or go in this direction. And it can be very, very overwhelming. If you fold into that mix someone who is not comfortable on the technology space, um, then you're down the rabbit hole of who can I trust and uh, you know, who's legitimate. And it just kind of, it's a domino effect of, of um, do, do I act or do I stay on the sideline knowing that I should act, but not knowing what to do? Um, what, what doesn't change is the need for technology in our business. I mean, that's, that's a fact. So how do we um, navigate that in a way that uh, kind of levels the playing field so that everybody can, uh, uh, can make progress 
And that's, that's through tools, that's through training, that's through, you know, just conversation like this to make sure that, that everyone understands it's relevant and you've got to figure it out somehow, some way, whether it's with a partner or, or learning on your own um, with, with no agenda other than uh, help is out there. You just, you gotta, you gotta find it. So, you know, I guess there's several areas that, that, that we could, 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 could touch upon and no particular right or wrong in terms of order. You know, we mentioned that, you know, marketing and sales was, was an area that, 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 that we could talk about, uh, scheduling and dispatch, you know, the whole operations, logistics, part of the business. Um, we talked a little bit, you know, t- talent acquisition and, 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 and management certainly is, is a hot topic today. Anything in that consideration set that anybody wants to jump on? Well, I first want to know if anybody has an answer to Robin's question. Because I don't. Google, they don't. Google doesn't tell you, but I mean, so yes, I think so. Because like most of the services like Bird's Eye or Nice Job try and post your, um, your reviews to Twitter and other social media and then link back to your Google Places page and other things. So, or your Google local pay, they change the name so many times. I always I can never remember which, which to call it. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe that it would have some minor effect on that, especially if you continuously, uh, you know, posted your reviews out to other social sources and uh, had links to relevant, relevant properties like your Google places page. This is also if you guys are looking for any of these places. It is so tell us.com. It is nice job.com. And then it's bird eye, no S in there, bird eye.com. Yeah. And if I were to recommend one for most of the people watching today, I think I would have to say nice job would do 90% of what you need for half the cost. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty robust for, you know, pretty good value for the money. So I, I opened a browser and I typed S and O and tell us popped up and I don't think I've ever been to this website. So that tells you how many people go to Google searching for this company. Yeah. And nice job is the third one. Yeah. Nice job. IO, I think. Yeah. We use nice job. Thought it. It's not nice job.com. I thought it was. Oh, it's get nice job.com. Okay. I'll click on. I wonder why they do that. I wonder why they do that versus using their, um, So back to Robin's question, just for a second, I dropped a link earlier. This, is, this paper's a little bit dated, especially when it comes to SEO, but it's the most recent one I can find from Moz that basically breaks down the factors that Moz has, has, has determined that, that Google uses to rank both on local SEO as well as um, the map pack. And the criteria is a little bit different. Um, like on the map pack, you know, the what they call the signals, the, the business signals, proximity, categories, keywords. So do you have a presence in the physical location that uh, that uh, you're, you're, you're searching on, for instance? Um, how about your links? What type of words do you use in your, your anchor text? And is that keywords matching what's being searched? Um, the reviews, the type of reviews that you're getting, the on-page signals, citations, so on and so forth. I dropped this link. I'll put that in there again, Robin, but if you read that, I think it, you'll, even though these have maybe have shifted some a little bit over the last couple of years, the general concept of what, uh, what Google looks for, for both the map pack as well as organic search that's still some, some useful info here. And, you know, coming from a, a purely arbitrary statistical standpoint, I mean, if you're going out there and, and taking action in these various areas, 
Um, that's probably more than 50% of your competitors. That's probably more than 75% of your competitors. Um, if you're in a big market, that might be different. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of your smaller cleaning companies, your mid-sized cleaning companies may not be um, checking off the boxes, right? They, they're, they're trying to keep operations in order. They don't have time uh, or maybe the, the partner to, to worry about all these things. So you're ahead of the game if you're even trying to check off seven of the 10 boxes. Um, knowing that those boxes always change, uh, something is, is better than nothing for certain. Yeah. It's about taking action. Remember, old business coach I used to have said, you know, CEOs have to be prone for action. Even if you aren't always doing the right thing, as a rule, you're going to be better off doing something as opposed to doing nothing. There you go. For sure. The only time I got to argue on this, you guys, if you're busy all the time and nothing's happening in your business and you're just going along doing the same old thing every single day, Sometimes you have to get off the hamster wheel. It's not okay to just be busy. I mean, you work all day, every single day, and nothing's happening. I'm sorry. You have to stop doing that stuff and start doing some of the right stuff. Now, I will agree with everybody. What they're talking about is activities that are going to grow your business. Do one of those. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't, don't just search through Facebook for more good ideas. You already did that. <laughs> stop doing that. You don't have to keep doing that. And just because you're doing that doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. There's Dan can tell you I hammer on people all the time about this. Yeah. There's a big difference between motion and movement. Make sure Where that you're doing the things that are moving you. You know, we're talking about technology and, and one thing is is that you don't have to be the one doing it all. I mean, a lot of this can be can be happening, you know, through automations in your business. I mean, you know, most of us have quite a bit of automated stuff in our life we don't even really think about like i uh i just did a workout after and, and right after i did it i got a little notice from peloton that said hey nice job do you want to stretch out now or something like that you know and it's automated and they're trying to get you to engage in the software a little bit more right it, you know with the or with the with the platform a little bit more and tie you in and um i just finished the 50th ride on the thing and it gives you a little certificate I mean, all of that's all of that's automated and, you know, and, and to condition us to do things. Oh, OK, I'm going to get back on that thing tomorrow. Um, that's marketing. And so like the way we do that in our businesses is we do things like reminders and we condition our clients that we're coming on certain days and certain times. And we're consistent on our we're consistent on the times that we show up and we use our software to make sure that we that we're consistent. We send the right teams on the right days with the right resources. Right. So, you know, a lot of activity can be done without you actually doing it. I mean, yeah, you don't have to burn the calories yourself. You put the processes in place and you know, the whole theme this week is using technology to grow your business. And maybe we should just take a minute and talk about that. If you think about, you know, where we've been and where technology was and where it is now, it's really been democratized where, you know, these tools that we're looking at for, for, for getting reviews or if we're talking about, you know, building our workforce, all the, the there's a ton of technology out there from applicant tracking systems to mm -hmm. learning management systems that are just really easy to manage and tools that, that, that promote, you know, employee engagement that, that, that automate a lot of that. I mean, hundreds of platforms on any one of these categories that, that, that you talk about. A lot of them are at a price point where, you know, they're within our reach. They're not like, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, certainly, you know, you had to be a, a publicly traded company, a very large company to, to afford some of this technology. And yeah. today it's, it's available to all of us. I, I remember 14 years ago, I really wanted Salesforce when I was starting my business because I wanted all the automations and the like bells and whistles for when like someone calls that it would tie into my, you know, to my CRM and it would track like all the interactions that we have with customers. I mean, that that is what Dan's building on his current website. I mean, he's basically got code on there. Like basically every time someone goes to his website, it's it's tracking those events and, and then it's, you know, what what you know, what happens next because they do this and, you know, it's, it's marketing on a very, it's marketing on the edges a little bit because he's doing so many other things on the, in the core, right? So now he can go out to the edges a little bit 
and you know use technology to kind of make even more money and maybe it's because he likes technology and he's good at it and it's just maybe it's fun <laughs> to play with this stuff too and, and you know sometimes i think you know dan and i are tinkers and you know that's just we're going to go play around the edges and see what we we come up with um but even just the core functionality of software was not available 10 years ago when i started my business i did it all on um we've been doing this instant quote thing for uh I don't know, 15, 14 years now, I don't know how long, we've been in business since 2013 years. And one of the first things I did was I put this instant quote on my website. All I did was I did some math that basically just added up, you know, different things based on whatever. And we would give somebody a price on our website. We were doing that 10 years ago, you know, 13 years ago, nobody else was doing that. And then now if you're not putting your price online, you're probably seen as probably, you know, maybe old fashioned. You don't have your quoting or, or whatever online, you know? So what does that mean? I have a hard time not going back and thinking about the way it used to be with you know, yellow page ads and in-home estimates. And we were cleaning companies and a big part of what we did was focus on removing soil from a surface. And a lot of the other stuff was just kind of fringe stuff, but it feels like it, we're as much technology companies today as we are anything else. We're spending all this time talking about SEO and, you know, I don't care what the process is. We're talking about what technology is out there to support it. Right. Yeah. So, what, what, <laughs> you know, what, what, what comes to mind is, um, is, is kind of a disclaimer, right? Uh, to your point, Tom, there are all these software pieces out there and, um, and they're affordable and they're within reach. Uh, but when you tie in what Liz said, there's the element of um, getting caught up in, in, in investing in software or investing in a solution and not implementing and not executing. And I know I've been there myself where you buy some new whiz bang and you think it's so great. And, you know, I, I'm, I venture to guess there's people on the call who, you know, they've got something that they plan to set up that they haven't quite set up yet, and they're getting charged every month. Um, and you really have to. Uh, my, my disclaimer is there. There's a lot of solutions out there that can improve the efficiency of your business. Um, pick one, focus on it, implement it, master it before moving to the next. Otherwise. Um, it can just be very, very overwhelming. So when we're talking about the topic as a whole, let us not forget the importance of executing through to production. That's that's key for sure. Yeah, I agree. I just talked about that today with marketing is that we all get like, we get distracted on 15 different things. And if you get really good at one, you should just keep putting quarters into that one thing and until the return starts dialing back a little bit. And then, I mean, you can still be going wide and testing things out. But, you know, having 15 things to measure and track is, is a lot harder than, you know, I, I really go, I leverage really hard on Facebook and, you know, AdWords I do just to stay relevant. You know, Google Google Places I do because it works and it's pretty much automatic or I'm, Google, I'm sorry, Google guaranteed. And then, um, you know, SEO is just something that, you know, you almost have to do to stay relevant. But, um, but yeah, if you pick a project like you're talking about, like executing on that that one project, take 90 days and really hammer it out and, and, you know, implement it and go and go out. I see people take six months to execute software and it's very expensive to do that. Um, it would be a lot easier just to, to knock it out in 30 to 90 days and just be live. Yeah. Does it, is our job changing though as CEOs of companies? I mean, it's certainly evolved over the years, right? And it looks different now than it did five years ago really from a technology standpoint i mean a bigger part of our job description is from a strategic standpoint making sure that we're we're, we're leveraging technology but so, i'm not sure that it's so much changed tom you have been hammering on this for years you have been saying this that it's a tech that we are in a tech business and in a uh, logistics business it's just saying that what it's logistics for sure, but I think the tech has changed three years ago. You've been I think. saying how long ago since you were oh, giving the big tech that's been, You know, that's been our shtick for, 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 for 20 some odd years. I mean, that's just yeah. kind of the world I came from. But 
And, and, and you're right. I mean, I, I was a logistics guy and I used technology and I always saw that as a competitive advantage. And I believe it always has been. And we've done OK in this industry. But I think it's it's on steroids now. It's just the, 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 the technology has become so ubiquitous. And it's just so much more of it out there. And there's so many options and stuff that we couldn't do even a couple of years ago or stuff that you could do that it really took some geek stuff and learning how to stand up a Linux server and build some stuff that now you can like with a credit card and 50 bucks a month, you've got it. And it's, 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 it's different in that regard. Yeah. It's, okay, it's so definitely very so democratized, like, like was said. So you guys are very, very techy. All three of you guys are very, very techy. I am not. And I would hazard a guess that a lot of the people that are on smart business moves also are not. So for people like us, like what do you recommend? How do we how do we be more techy? What do we look at? What do we, you know, what's the what's what's the smart business move for us? I like what Dan said. Execute on one thing, get it right and do and then stack that on until you have your tech stack built. One thing at a time. I mean, it, it's just too critical. I mean I was looking at I was looking at someone's data, just coaching them the other day, and they were like, they had all these jobs. They were telling me that, that their price was forty five dollars an hour. And they had all these jobs, like, and they they were made service made central customer, but they just hadn't looked at this report yet. They didn't know what was available. And I was digging through, and I was running a report for them, and I was like, you are not making forty five dollars an hour. You're not. You're making thirty seven. Can you pay your bills at thirty seven dollars an hour and pay your people? And she's like, I don't think so. And I'm like. You better start knowing so. I don't think it's a choice. I think you have to start knowing these these this data at a, at, a, at a finer degree, because we keep talking about wages going up. Well, you can't pay higher wages if you don't know that you're you're able to control your your cost of goods sold in a way. Um, I, I mean, you could do it on spreadsheets, and I think that's fine. Um, you know, that's technology too. That's a form of technology, but you you better be you better be managing that like every day. You better not be letting stuff slip through the cracks. So my my suggestion would be to go back to what Dan said is master one thing and then and then master the next. You know, I'll I'll add to that, and and this is not um, unique to 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 any one person because I've I've fallen victim to this along the way uh, myself. But um, picture a matrix, right? You've got you've got all these options of what you need to do to build your business, and in this block right here, it is Facebook posts. And in this block over here, it's blog posts. And in this block over here, it's an, uh, a great website. And you've got one more block over here that is email marketing. Um, holistically, the better approach is to slowly build your foundation, right, before you fold into these, uh, these other um, solutions. But all too often, um, small business owners, medium business owners um, kind of cherry pick, right? I, well, I, I know I got a Facebook post. And I know I have to um, send out something on Google My Business, uh, and you know what? I want to send out emails as well. But but that fragmented solution um, maybe maybe doesn't work to your advantage if you were systematically just kind of building that strong foundation and then stacking things on top of it. Just today, um, in in our MMA group, we were talking about um, leading the business with a proactive mindset. Uh, all too often, we get caught in the reactionary as small business owners, medium business owners. We're we're in a reactionary mindset, right? Um, this is not working today, uh, so I've got to fix it. Or this is the fire of the hour. This is taking all my attention. And at the end of the day, you can go home exhausted and you're wore out, and the um, your to do list just kind of grows and and you know just it's there. Um, but when you're operating with a proactive mindset, what can I do today and apply that to technology, apply that to operations, apply that to recruiting. What can I do today that is going to head off that, um, that collision that's, that's going to happen if I don't do anything or what can I do today that's going to improve the sales um, for tomorrow or what processes can I put in place today that is going to improve my employee retention. Um, you know, we can talk about technology and that is, that's today's topic, but, but when you roll in that proactive mindset, um, it's just as important. It's not relative just to technology, but being proactive in your business, Tom, making changes to wages 
now when he doesn't have to. It's a proactive measure for the greater good as opposed to the reactionary, um, well, everyone else is doing it. I have to, to make that change as well. Um, so I, I, I kind of echo uh, what Matt said. There is um, the, uh, the, the pick your battles, um, but, but doing so proactively, I think, is what, what is going to gain more ground than just kind of putting out fires on a, on a day-to-day basis. Which, yeah. which is kind of akin to, you know, being prone to action. It's, it's, it's not about doing the daily minutia, checking your email every day. It's about what are the things I need to accomplish that are going to be moving me forward. And, you know, we talk, if you do foundations, we, you'll hear us talking about reversible decisions. And a lot of times we spend a lot of time wrestling with, do I do something that, If you try it, if it doesn't work, it really doesn't cost you very much and you can undo it the next day. So it's a much, you'll move much faster if if you can identify it as a reversible decision. You go, what's the worst case that'll happen? And if you apply it to technology, it's like play with it, you know, get it, get that free trial and look and see and talk to other, your peers and other people in the industry. I love tinkering and, you know, I'm up there with everybody else and tinkering a dozen years ago, I think actually was a more rational thing to do because if you didn't tinker to figure it out, you weren't going to get there. I mean, we built telephone switches, we built IVR, but we did all kinds of just great. We built our own GPS solution and put it on a Nextel beep beep telephone because there wasn't anything else out there. Tinkering in 2021 needs to look a little bit different because why build it when you can put it on a credit card for a mass amount of money every month and you just got it? At the end of the day, we should be making money in our cleaning businesses, not trying to tinker some solution that somebody already did a whole lot better and has made it very affordable for us. Yeah, sound advice. I, I do think it is, is important and I know we don't want to have this be like a big made central pitch all the time, but that this is one thing that I really like about made central that I don't think enough people talk about or give credence to, especially for people that maybe are not all that tech savvy. Made central brings a lot of the processes all together under one roof so that you don't have to have this thing here and this thing here and this thing here and this thing here. Like, it doesn't have to be made central, but really you got to have some way of getting everything all together because the stuff has to play well together. Also, not, not everything works together. So you get this and it doesn't quite sync up with this and kind of jury rig it and make it work. Was that a bad term? No, I think it was okay. I was like, well, what did I say? Um, but I, I think that that's also a, an important piece is finding tech that can make everything easier. If, if you, the technology that you're using is making your life harder, <laughs> you need to rethink that. You need to, you need to like simplify. And, and Matt mentioned the technology stack. That's a fancy term for what type of software are you going to be licensing to, 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 to run your business? And before you get too deep into spending money on that, you really need to look at your workflow. And this is, uh, this is something that, that, that we use in foundations as well. And every cleaning business kind of looks like this. And every one of these boxes is a process within your business. This stuff at the top here is basically finding people that want to clean homes and hiring them and training them. This line in the middle is basically your marketing and advertising and sales and finding homes to clean. There's some other logistic stuff down here, supplies and equipment, but you take the people who clean homes, the homes that need to be cleaned and some supplies and you mix it all together in scheduling and you send teams out to clean and you clean. And you got support activities where you're you know, doing your accounting, your payroll, your customer service, your quality, so on and so forth. Every company looks like this, right? So when you're looking at technology, what technology are you going to use to create as much efficiency in terms of the backroom help you need to make all this happen, plus getting maximum outcomes in your business in terms of providing quality service, hiring good people, cleaning homes and being profitable in doing it. And 
so many of these processes are interrelated where if you get a, a, a quality score that ties into your employees, that also ties into your customer, that ties into your training. If you've got separate systems that don't talk to each other, then you don't even see what it is that you need to be doing. So that's where it kind of gets into Matt's technology stack. And a lot of software can, can kind of be put together. Uh, Dan's talking about, you know, Zapier, Zapier. I've heard it Zapier. Zapier makes you happier. Um, <laughs> but however, however they, 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 they pronounce it, um, you want to be thinking bigger than just that activity. It's about the data. This is what I'm trying to say. Well, it's the, about the, you know, part of it is the activity, but a bigger part of it is the data that goes along with the activity because yeah, that's just collecting data, Tom. Like so, so many, so many of us are data collectors, and you know, you you, you need to be able to use that data in your business too. Because I know lots of people that run lots of reports, but it's not tied to anything actionable. Like, like you know, that's where that's why if it's coming into software, like whether it's Made Central, I'll name some others. And Made is, is an admirable competitor, you know, for companies that aren't ready for Made Central. Like some something would be better than nothing where you're bringing this data in. And and I don't mean that, that you know, that, that, you know, you couldn't run your business on a whiteboard, but I don't know how you could, you know, the I don't, you couldn't get to my size. You couldn't get to Tom's size with three branches. You will hit limits where, where just collecting data without software and solutions will not work. I know some people that have built substantial businesses with desk calendars and pencils with very sharp points on them. Okay. It's amazing. But I do believe that every day that goes by, they're at a greater competitive disadvantage because of the technology that's being introduced into our industry. And at some point, you know, what used to work, I don't think, I don't, you know, I can't see how those companies are going to continue to be as competitive in the future as what they have been in the past because of the technology that's out there. I do want to say to Matt real quick, uh, Matt, we have someone in a mastermind group that does a $2 million business and they use Salesforce and it doesn't track ROI on your marketing. Really? Mm-hmm. No, it's marketing software. It, it has to. I'm telling you, you he he's been using it for how many years, Dan? Five? Uh yeah, if if not a little more than that. He, he can't figure it out. He can't find it. This is not a stupid guy. No, I know. I, yeah, and I, and I you know, me and Tom were evaluating HubSpot the other day. And, you know, it was like a twenty five thousand dollars check we were talking about stroking. We're like, we just couldn't we just couldn't get ourselves there yet. Like we we want it someday, maybe. Um, maybe the tool is just too much. Maybe it's just not the right tool. And, you know, cause I was, I was definitely attracted to it. Like it looks like this amazing tool. But, and part of it was what, what Dan was talking about earlier. It was the implementation part of it is like, you know, if we're going to spend that much money, we may need to make really sure that we've got maximum bandwidth to put it to use. And we just, don't have that right now. Yeah, that, that's the biggest issue is like, it would be me implementing it. And I was like, oh, one more thing that I've got to do on top of running two companies is is implement software, a big software change. Let's hold off on that till, till a little later. <laughs> um, I can make active campaign work a little bit longer. I like active campaign. You know, I, I got myself to like it and, and made some Zapier integrations work. Good deal. Yeah. You know, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about um, technology. We're kind of strategizing all across the board. Um, for, for me, you know, being um, newer in the industry than the rest of the panel here, right? We're, we're at five years in the industry. For me, the biggest awakening um, early on uh, was it's not about the cleaning. And that's, that's my phrase. That's kind of what I was able to muster when I came to realize um, we have to deliver good service. We have to clean. We have to take care of our clients. Um, all of that is is critically important. But operationally as a whole, it's it's not about the cleaning, right? It's about how you operate the business. It's about how you um, use technology, how you uh, mend relationships, build relationships and rapport and trust with your employees, the culture of your business. And, and this, this technology piece is just one component. Um, and, and I say that because there's, there's a lot of 
businesses out there that are that are center focused on um, the best cleaning experience. And 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 I don't I don't want to detour them from that, but it's not just about the cleaning, right? It's not just about the the disinfectant you use. It's it's about how efficiently you're running your business and 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 to close technology is the most um, uh, impactful ROI when it comes to building out your operations in in my in my opinion. And Good that, you're talking about getting ahead of it. And if you think it is now, <laughs> you know, a year from now, two years from now, it's just going to become more and more important. So, you know, every day counts. Yeah, sure. All right. What time is it, Liz? It is on my clock. It's three oh one. My guess is on yours. It's three o'clock. It is. No, it's six o'clock actually. But oh, six o'clock. it's at top of the hour. Are we good for the week? Yeah, I think we are. Thank you, back, everybody. Are we going to be back Monday? We are. What are we going to talk about? I don't know. If you leadership. check your the leader, the calendar says leadership. Leadership. All right. We'll be talking about leadership, y'all. Next week, Monday, 5 o'clock Eastern. Be here. Dan, Matt, thank you both. You guys are awesome. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, guys.